right, guys. So uh, today uh, we're here to talk about, there we go, uh, increasing your average case size with value. So um, as Jamie said, um, I was the number one producer uh, last year, and uh, I've known to uh, have some pretty large uh, uh, individual clients, and uh, here I am. Now I'm going to share with you uh, the secret sauce to what I do. Um, so when it comes to uh, increasing your average case size, um, a lot of people um, initially believe that that's at the point of sale um, when it comes to adding value, but ultimately value is added at the very beginning, the very first interaction. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that and uh, the agenda. So um, we're going to have the pregame. So the pregame is basically how to set up your and uh, how to set up your position to connect with and to prepare for your client. Uh, the play-by-play, -play. so that would be the tackles and the maneuvers to drive the conversation by letting the clients sell themselves. And um, also, I just want to make a quick mention to Laval and Darren, because I did pick their brain a little bit before, and uh, they provide some insights, so uh, thank you guys. Appreciate it. And then the post-game. So the post-game is um, basically what you need to know to lock and load uh, your sale, uh, to encourage repeat business, referrals, and then essentially increase customer retention. So as I mentioned, value starts at the beginning, the first interaction. Um, the first topic I want to kind of highlight here is the universe. And you know, some things we need to know, uh, people are inundated with content and connections. Uh, people are egocentric, and people expect consistency and instant communication, and business is now 24-7. So there's an emphasis on to you, because at the heart of everything, it's one person amongst the many channels of communication. You know, the client's inundated with so many different things, bombarded to them different types of sales and advertising. And ideally, what you need to do is you need to figure out how to get through the clutter. So uh, you need to get to know the client as a person and find the best avenues to speak with them um, and build conversation with them as well. So I've met clients uh, buying stuff off Kijiji. I've met um, and uh, I've turned many of my personal connections into clients um, by uh, building rapport with them. You can also use social media, LinkedIn, see what they like, shared connections uh, that you may have, be on call to them, never leave a client uh, hanging. Um, if they call and you're busy, automatically send a text and say you'll call them shortly. And actually call them, don't be shy to connect. Uh, sell the line, you know, worst case scenario is at least, well, the worst case scenario is that you'll know a little bit more than you know now, right? Um, and this all leads to knowing your client. So. Um, you want to find out what their values are by asking open-ended questions. You want to figure out whether they have a family, no family, what their family dynamics are. And most importantly, you want to find out the client's reason why. Why is it that they do what they do? Why is it that they're choosing to sit down with you? Um, and that tells you the narrative that you can essentially approach them on. Um, also, uh, your relatable story. So your relatable story is so people like people that are like them. Um, uh, Shirley and Rick Forbes uh, yesterday mentioned uh, Form, which is actually um, a pretty good tool to, to find out what your client's all about, family, occupation, recreation, message. And uh, Frank also talked a little bit more uh, a little bit yesterday in regards to your story, and just like you stories, and emotional valley stories, and emotional peak stories, right? By uh, sharing your story with your client, essentially you're building that rapport and you're breaking down all the walls. And by breaking down all the walls, when you go to position your, uh, your recommendation to your client, it, they're more receptive ultimately. Um, so I do want to kind of illustrate um, or talk a little bit about my story. And I want to see if you can guys uh, can kind of see the different parts that are within. So uh, my parents came down. Uh, you know, my dad immigrated from the Middle East, my mom immigrated from the Caribbean in the 80s, and uh, they had me down in Toronto. Um, I lived in, a, at that point in time, it was a pretty rough area. Um, now it's kind of cleaned up a little bit. It was Jane and Wilson. And um, I grew up kind of hearing gunshots at night, and, you know, uh, we were told never to go in the staircase at night and never go to the parking garage top floor because, you know, people that you don't really want to interact with, that's where they'd hang out. And, um, you know, growing up, I noticed that my parents weren't uh, financially sound. So I watched them piece together checks and child benefits checks and what have you to pay for rent and food. And ultimately, it's nothing against them. Um, they did what they could do to, to provide for us. Um, for, we were fortunate enough to actually move down to Mississauga. And um, Mississauga is where I was kind of exposed to different pockets of affluence here. I got to see, you know, low income, medium income, higher income individuals. And that uh, allowed me to be inspired to, to, to want to be at that higher level. I always, um, 
Yesterday I mentioned that uh, my childhood dream was to make $100,000 and to me that was, that was the equivalent of making a million dollars now and I was like, wow, if I can get there, one day I may have the opportunity to also teach other people how to get there. So uh, my, I've always had an affinity for cars and I became a mechanic and uh, somehow um, to this day I still don't know how the Bank of Montreal found my resume and decided to give me a call. And um, <laughs> Yeah, they gave me a call one day and they asked me uh, to come and work for them. I worked for their call center and um, essentially that's where I got even more exposed to how Canada was financially. I got to see people that you know weren't doing so well. I got to see people that were doing really well. I got to talk to people, pick their brains and gain a bigger perspective on Canada as a whole. And from there, um, there was one day where I had two calls. And those two calls, um, two completely separate family groups, one was making about $60,000, the other one was making about $300,000. And um, you know they were very much different, but they were also very same in two ways. The first way being that they both had a lot of debt, and the second way is that neither of them had any savings whatsoever. So I was sitting there having lunch, and it dawned on me, it's like, why is it that a family group that can make five times the income um, be in the same position as somebody making five times less? And, you know, if I can identify the reason why, then I can also, I might be able to find out where my next move is so I can help, you know, provide the solutions. So, um, it, my journey took me over to Sun Life. Sun Life is where um, I kind of started to learn the, the industry a little bit. And, uh, yes, Jamie, Xperia's training is far better than Sun Life's. <laughs> By far, no comparison. Um, and from Sun Life, um, you know, I got to learn the industry and that's where, you know, I realized there was something more out there. I need to be able to do more. Um, and uh, that's where it led me to Xperia. And Xperia is essentially where I had the opportunity to work with my clients in a way where there's never an opportunity for me to say no. Whatever their needs are, whatever their situation is, I can help them. And that's where I've made it my home and that's why I do what I do. So um, essentially, that's, that's my story, and that's what I tell my clients. And one thing I want to mention about your story is that your story should, ever, should be ever evolving, right? So by when you um, meet your client initially and you have that conversation, right, you want to pick things where you can actually custom tailor your story to become more relatable to your client in the sense where if I find out certain things about my client's family dynamics, um, where they work and what have you, I'll try to throw those things into my story, more or less. Final thing is uh, build trust and gain confidence. So you want to be clear and consistent with your intentions. A uh, perfect way to do that is the uh, very first uh, page in uh, the EFA, which is the client intro page, right? Right at the very beginning, you're talking about trust, respect, customize. You're talking about having the ability to provide a, an opportunity for people um, if uh, it so happens to be it. Um, and you want to be present with your client and also remember the golden rule and the golden rule which I've come to know is treat people how they want to be treated, right? All right, so the play-by-play. -play. So insurance. So now we've gone past the first part, we're sitting down with the client, we've added some value, we're breaking down the barriers, we've bonded and rapport with them. Now uh, we've come in for our, our recommendations. Um, generally when I do insurance, I like to come in with uh, a good, better, best strategy. Um, so the good would essentially be the bare minimum of coverage, the better is the recommended coverage, and the best would be the full-blown Cadillac of plans, like Laval likes to call it. And um, we want to sell the best, obviously, right? Um, health to factor in higher amounts. So essentially, adding critical illness to a sale amount. You can add it as a rider. You can add it as a standalone. Um, but always try to add this feature. So I'll break down my appointments and go over everything before pitching my full recommendations, rather than try to sell different items at, at multiple different times. And then uh, a couple things we want to recognize is that shopping is time consuming. So we want to talk to our client about how we shop the market for them and that they have access to, we have access to a good spread of the market. And then um, I'll go into a, a few more tips to, on how to increase premium. 
So when I go for the close, I always like to st start out with our completed uh, expert financial analysis, EFA, and reiterate the items that they mentioned that, they were, that were important to them. So for example, I would sit down with a client, I'm like, okay, going back to the analysis we put together, uh, you mentioned that making sure that you have X amount of dollars for X amount of years as replacement income is important to you. You also mentioned that having so on and so forth is important to you, money set aside for your kids, money set aside for funeral and final expenses, Mr. and Mrs. Client, does that still prove true? Does that still hold true? And I'll get them to, to agree with that. So now we're going to go into a little bit of a case study. So um, here, uh, client ha age 35 has $950,000 of life insurance and makes a salary of 150k. Wife's a homemaker with no income and one child age five. So here we kind of see the breakdown as to what their um, what those different needs are. So mortgage, covering the mortgage, covering their debts. Uh, providing replacement income for uh, five years, um, funeral and final expenses, children's education, and they mentioned they kind of want to stay in and around the $260 budget. So as I mentioned, the good is the bare minimum of insurance, right? So I'm not going to really focus on the good and better solutions as much, but I want to illustrate how you communicate these uh, uh, solutions in general. So uh, no matter which solution you are presenting, uh, you want to give them the information they need to know and always reflect it back to their needs. Because in this case, you're honest and you're presenting all options, but of course you want them to take the, the, the best options. Now notice how I translate, or notice how I transition from this good solution to the better. So the better is where we break it down into, uh, we break it down a little bit more, slightly higher premium. You know, we're giving them uh, a little bit more critical illness. Um, you know, it's, it's a fairly solid, comfortable plan. Right. Um, contrary to popular format of going from good to better to best, in my experience, it's better to uh, uh, present the options in reverse. So I actually start with the best solution first because the cost focus uh, shifts to a focus on value. So people's attention spans are short. They st uh, so what I do is I start high so they see value in what we can do for them right away, and then the cheaper solutions will feel like settling to them. Because ultimately, when we're coming to our clients, we're telling them that we're going to do the best we can for them, so why not start with the best? Um, when you start with the lowest, uh, the lowest first and work up, people tend to focus on the cost of the product, which is a practical buying uh, solution or decision. Whereas when you start high and then you go low, um, then the client focuses on the value of the product instead, which is both a practical and emotional buying decision, and that creates more stickiness to the purchase. So the way you explain things shouldn't be necessarily be focused on price, it should be focused on the value of the product based on the narrative and values that you would have identified in your pregame conversation. Uh, you want to use words with people that resonate well, so um, words like best and peace of mind to make an emotional connection for the client, and repeat the keywords that they say, like financial freedom. Um, so, uh, like in the show, uh, say yes to the dress, as my wife puts it. <laughs> she wants to look bridal, whatever that means, and um, women tend to dish out thousands of uh, dollars for a little extra bling and drama, not the cheap and frugal looking dress. So this is essentially the same sort of concept or idea that you want to take with your client, right? May soon gets it. I hope you all do too. <laughs> So tips to a higher premium. So uh, a couple things here. If you notice your clients are in better than average health, you can always ask them, Mr. or Mrs. Client. Um, there may be a chance that you may get a, a preferential pricing. Uh, I know some of our pro providers automatically do that. Uh, you may get preferential pricing on, on what we put together for you today in the event that uh, you do end up saving a few bucks on uh, uh, the products and services that we're providing. Uh, would it make sense to uh, use those few dollars to give you some additional coverage, right? Um, another, another tip to increasing your premiums, adding, adding um, the value of inflation to illustrate the loss of value over time. Inflation's at 2%. You talk to your client, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Client, um, a funeral that costs $30,000 uh, $30, today uh, won't, will, will cost considerably more 30 to 40 years down the road. How about we inflate this a little bit, right? Um, I mentioned how you start high and work your way down. And then, um, you know, Francis uh, did an amazing talk on uh, children's uh, insurance for children. Um, another tip would be adding children's riders and utilizing conversion privileges. Uh, so I know some of our uh, providers do allow a conversion of five times uh, the children rider, and this could be a way for uh, your client to essentially 
have uh, coverage that's a little bit affordable at the beginning, but at the same time ensure that their child remains insurable in the future. So now we're gonna move to investments. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about the value of working with an advisor, um, how to talk to clients about doing a transfer, uh, dollar cost averaging, benefits of segregated funds, and the time value of money, the high cost of waiting. So when you're talking to your clients on the investment side, you know these are the things that clients are essentially prone to. Um, insufficient knowledge and, and wrong decisions being made uh, during the investment buying process. Um, duration of investments, uh, the involvement of emotions, and following the herd. So um, the average individual, you know, we're all prone, um, you know, we're, we're all preconditioned to, to this sort of thing where um, we try to do it ourselves. And um, you want to talk to your client about how they can use an advisor to help avoid some common mistakes that people make when it comes to their money and investing. Um, you want to talk to your client about how you have uh, ongoing training and support, not only from the wholesalers, but your brokerage as a whole, in order to equip you with the right information to assist them in making the right decision. Um, you can talk to your client in, in regards to bear and bull markets and how you can assist them when it comes to not selling out a loss due to fluctuating market cycles as well. Uh, just recognize that people are emotionally attached to money. So how, your job is to essentially detach them from their emotions and help them make logical based decisions. People follow the herd. Um, they make investment decisions um, based on what people are doing versus what are right for them. So you want to talk to your client about how you can help them circumnav circumnavigate all of those. Fidelity Investments actually has some really, really good slides that I tend to keep with me. I actually print them off and laminate them, and when I am talking to my clients about investments, I talk to them essentially uh, referencing these slides. Um, it's always good to have a nice visual there. So this is one of my favorite slides where it talks about the power of compounding. And um, essentially, it's, a, it's easy for people to put off investing. Um, the common perception is that you, if you don't have enough money to invest now, it's better to contribute more later. So this explains how uh, one of the best ways to build wealth, uh, which is essentially to start early, even if it's a small amount. So what I would tell my clients in, in this scenario is that you have John and Susan, uh, both of them have contributed uh, in a 10 year span. However, John has been in the market for 20 years since he started earlier. Susan's only been in the market for 10 years, she started later. John put $50,000 in total. Susan uh, wants to play catch up, so she decides to put double the amount of money. But in the end, you can see how it all plays out. John ends up having more money in, in his investments versus Susan. Another thing to talk to your client about is, is uh, dollar cost averaging, right? What I like to tell them is that uh, dollar cost averaging is a way to buy, buy your money at a discount. And uh, we essentially talk a little bit um, in regards to how dollar cost averaging can help them make, uh, help their dollar stretch farther. Um, I also like to talk to my clients about benefits of segregated funds, how um, in, in respects to investments, um, we can do a few things that the banks can, and one of them would be segregated funds. We talk a little bit about uh, the guarantees, uh, the creditor proofing, um, how you can name a beneficiary for non-registered accounts, um, how, and then you tie that all back into peace of mind, which is the benefit statement that the client resonates with. All right, and then uh, we talk about staying in the markets, right? The value of staying in the markets and riding the highs and the lows. Um, this is another slide I like to, to use, and um, basically, uh, it basically talks about if a person had about $10,000 fully invested in the markets, uh, the chances of getting involved in the best performing market cycles are higher versus pulling their money out when the markets are low or even waiting to invest. Um, you'd want to talk to your client about how time reduces the vol volatility of their returns, especially when it comes to equities. And people tend to shy away from certain investments because in the short term they can be volatile, but historically um, some of these investments tend to be less volatile the longer you hold them. Uh, you talk to your client about the high cost of waiting uh, to enter the markets. That's something that I, that I, that I definitely emphasize with uh, pro uh, GIC customers. Uh, for example, my mother-in-law who does not want to take her money out of GICs no matter what because it's deemed safe. Um, so I, you, know, you want to talk to your clients about how uh, inflation can essentially erode away the value of their investments and how uh, waiting to enter the markets at the right time may not be the best fit for them and how um, they're not going to be able to maximize as much as entering it now. All right, and last but not least, so we're talking about the post game. So uh, a couple things here, the, the recommendation template, a reason why letter, 
Um, scheduling follow up meetings upon closing and asking permission to add to your newsletter and showing value of being referred. So when people think of, when they think of their average case size, um, increasing their average case size with value, they think of essentially at that given moment with the client and not about the future, right? So future sales. Um, albeit if you set yourself up correctly and take the time to educate your client, the value can be had long after the sale. Uh, one thing I definitely like to use is a recommendation template. What I do is when I, ask, I sit down with my client, I'm going in for the recommendation. Um, I like to put together a one or two pager that basically goes through everything and anything that I'm putting together for them. So I'm going in details about the products I'm, and I'm also putting the reason why we're recommending this and how it would benefit them. Um, to me, this, is, this has helped me in so many ways. It's used as a reference point for future meetings. In the case that we don't put certain things in place, it's something to reference by. And at the same time, um, it allows us to have a clear understanding of what's going on. Um, another thing that's kind of happened with this is that um, clients have uh, been approached by other advisors and instead of saying, well, you know what, maybe there is uh, something better out there, they know exactly what they have and essentially why they have it and they use this as a reference point to, 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 to help, uh, help me keep my business. <laughs> Um, reason why letter. So um, the reason why letter, another, uh, what, another thing that I do in our, our reason why letters and recommendation templates is I put the agenda for our follow-up meetings as well. So essentially my clients always know what I'm coming back to talk about, uh, talk about with them. And we always schedule that on our closing appointment. So essentially if my, I actually had a recent client who I did an insurance sale with and on my reason why my recommendation letter I did put that on our next visit we we're going to talk about RESPs and guess what happened? Somebody walked into her workplace and started talking to her about RESPs. And it just so happens I delivered everything at her workplace not too long ago, so she had everything with her and she pulled it right out and said, well, no, my advisor is actually coming to talk to me on this date about RESPs. I think I'm good, right? So um, making sure that you set the agenda and you set the expectation with your client right from the get-go is very important. All right. And um, you want to add your client to your advisor stream newsletter that gives your client the perception that you're constantly thinking about them um, and that they're on your mind and in turn uh, you'll be top of their mind when a referral comes around. And the final thing is uh, the value of being referred. So talk to your client about um, how being referred allows you to spend more time with them doing um, extra things for them that you necessarily wouldn't be able to do had you have to go out and find your next client. I guess that's all for now. Yeah, we're good to go. Hey, if you like this video or any of the other videos that I have on my channel, stay tuned. We have so many more coming, but I want to make sure that you're in the know, that you know when they're coming. So please subscribe to this channel if you haven't already and make sure you hit the notification bell.